Dear brothers and sisters in Christ and those who are watching us online, grace, mercy, and peace is from God for you. Happy Pentecost Day. Jesus is risen, and we believe it. All thanks to the Holy Spirit. That's why we celebrate Pentecost Day. And today, I get to use God's word and share with you uh, the grace that he has for you, and the Holy Spirit's going to use that to do amazing things. Words are funny, aren't they? There are certain words that you can use, and they sometimes have a positive connotation or a negative connotation. It can be the exact same word. For example, being sick. Sick is almost always having a negative connotation. No one's excited about sick. But then people take that word and they turn it into like an exclamation, like, oh man, that's sick, because it's like, cool. So which is it? Is it something that makes you feel horrible and awful, or is it something that's really, really cool? Words are funny, aren't they? Certain words can have a positive or negative connotation. The same is also true with the word privilege. Today we're talking about the privilege of the Holy Spirit, and the word privilege seems to have both a positive and negative connotation. A person can be privileged. Oh, I'm so privileged. Now, what does privilege even mean? It means that a person has special favor given to them, special, unique. And so someone could look at an individual and go, their parents have all this money, they have all the connections, they never have to work for a single thing in their life, they're going to get into whatever school they want to get into, they'll pay someone to do all their homework for them, they're going to get an amazing job because their parents know people, they're so privileged. But privilege also has a very good positive connotation to it. Like, I had an extreme privilege. I still remember, my, uh, I spent a year in Mexico between my sophomore and junior year in college, and the soccer team in the town there that year was playing in like the championship game. And everyone wanted to go to that game. And I wanted to go, but it was impossible to get tickets, let alone for somebody who doesn't know anybody and has a hard time speaking Spanish. Well, one of my students that I was teaching gave me and my roommate tickets to that game. And we had like incredible seats right in the middle of the field and our team won five to zero. They won the championship. Wow, that was an incredible privilege. And that's a good thing. And so today, as we talk about the privilege of the Holy Spirit, God's goal for you through his word is to make sure that our hearts are in the right place, that the privilege of the Holy Spirit doesn't turn into a negative thing for you, but rather it is something that we cherish and appreciate for the grace that it is. And we'll do that by looking at three truths about the Holy Spirit, looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 1. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans or unbelievers, somehow or another you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Speaking of gifts from the Holy Spirit, the ultimate gift from the Holy Spirit is Faith, And that's truth number one. If you're writing notes and you want to pick up a pen and write that down, truth number one, faith is a miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit. Faith is a miraculous gift by the Holy Spirit because that's what it says in 1 Corinthians. He was talking to the, first, the Corinthians and he was telling them, you know what you used to be like, right? You used to be unbelievers, being led astray, following idols. And, and the word in the Greek there is fun because it's saying, like, that is what you were. You were someone who was being led astray. You were following the wrong thing. And a lot of people in the world, even in Christianity, say, oh, yeah, by nature, we're following the wrong thing. All we have to do is stop following that thing and start following Jesus. But it says you were following, being led by the wrong thing, and you were, like, this is who you were, you were a follower. You were someone who is led away. So, like, here's a good way to illustrate what that is and what we are by nature. Anyone seen the movie Bug's Life? A Bug's Life is a cartoon movie about bugs. 
and they have personalities and they talk and there's this whole story. And there's a scene, it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie where there's two flies who are buzzing around one of those bug zappers. And all of a sudden one of the flies stops flying and just focuses on the light and starts buzzing towards it. And the other one's like, no, Harry, don't look into the light. And he's like, I can't help it. It's so beautiful. <laughs> and he gets zapped. It's hilarious. <laughs> That's what we are by nature. We are not just being led astray. We cannot go any other way. We are led by the world and the devil and our sinful nature to anything but God. And it's like, don't go to those things. Go to God. But it's so beautiful. <laughs> And there's nothing else that I can do. Understand that. You, by nature, the way that you were born, weren't just being led astray from God, but you were a person who was always being led astray. There was no other option for you. That's where the gift of the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit came into your life and worked a miracle, something that is unnatural, something that without the Holy Spirit could never have happened. You turned from idols, and you turned to your Savior in faith. You believed in him. That's why it says no one, not a single person, is able to say, believe in their heart, and confess with their mouth that Jesus is their Lord and their Savior if the Holy Spirit doesn't first work a miracle in them. The ultimate gift of the Spirit is the miraculous gift of faith. That's truth number one. All right, let's go to truth number two, starting at, uh, continuing at verse four. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but all of them and in everyone, it is the same work of God, at God. Truth number two, if you're writing this down, you're taking notes. God distributes gifts to everyone. God distributes gifts to everyone. This one's pretty straightforward. There's one God. He has all of the spiritual gifts, and he gives all of them to, and I think this is the key, everyone, which means not a single one of you here today can say, well, I don't have any spiritual gifts. No, no, no. Truth number two. God distributes gifts to everyone, and you are included with everyone, which means that you have spiritual gifts. Okay, that was a quick one. Wow. We're already on number three. Spiritual truth number three comes from verse seven. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common Good. Um, if you want to underline that word, common good, there's a, a word picture there. The idea is carry together with for a good purpose. Carry together with. So the gifts that are distributed to you, the spiritual gifts that you have, have a purpose. It's not just that you have them, you're like, oh, I wonder what I'm going to do with these. You have spiritual gifts, and there is a purpose for them. To work together, to do work for the common good. And what is the greatest good that we as a group collective can do? Well, Jesus told us, go Christians and make disciples. Go and make disciples by bringing Jesus to them, baptizing them and teaching. And so spiritual truth number three is, if you're writing notes, the gifts are given for growing more believers. The spiritual gifts are given for growing more believers. Okay, we're going to review. Let's see if you remember. If you were taking notes, it's going to be easy. Spiritual truth number one. Faith is a miraculous gift from the Holy Spirit. Spiritual truth number two. God distributes all gifts to everyone. Spiritual truth number three. The gifts are given for growing more believers. Now, this is where it gets fun. Paul talks about the spiritual gifts, specific spiritual gifts. He says, all right, here's some of the gifts that were given to grow more believers. Uh, to one, there is given the spirit of a message of wisdom. To another, a message of the knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another, faith. By the way, just an asterisk here, like every believer gets faith. 
It's not like I'm a believer, but I don't get faith. How does that work? This is like an overabundant outpouring of faith that one commentator says, like, this person assaults the throne of God with their worries and their cares and their problems and throws it all on him because they have nowhere else to go. I know people like that in this congregation. It's incredible. Okay, so that's that spiritual gift of faith. Faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kind of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of the one and same spirit, and he distributes them to each one, there it is again, just as he determines. Now, it is vitally important that we understand the context here and we interpret these passages from God's word correctly so that we don't come up with a false doctrine. You can read these lists of spiritual gifts and go, oh. I mean, we have people who speak with wisdom, I hope, or people who speak with knowledge. You know, that's good. And we have people who have faith. Um, gifts of healing? I, I don't know if we have that one. Miraculous powers? Mm, I don't think so. Prophecy, like direct revelation from God and speaking his word? I don't think we have that one. Uh, speaking in tongues, distinguishing spirits, interpreting tongues. No, 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 uh, I don't think so. Are we failing? Are we not good Christians because we don't have these spiritual gifts? No, <laughs> don't think that. We don't have to have these spiritual gifts. In Romans, when Paul is talking to a different group of Christians, he highlights the spiritual gifts that they have. Romans chapter 12 says, If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Those lists are completely different. So which spiritual gifts are we supposed to have? See, the truth is, the Holy Spirit dis distributes them to each one of us for a purpose. And what's that purpose? To grow more believers. Which means, in the church in Corinth, do you know what spiritual gifts they needed to grow the church and grow more believers? These ones listed here. And do you know what gifts the Romans needed to work together to grow more believers? The ones that were listed here. The reason why we don't have healings in our church today is because we have doctors, hospitals, and nurses. The reason why we don't have speaking in tongues or direct prophecy from God is because we have God's Word. <laughs> we don't need direct revelation from God. We have the New Testament. They didn't have that back then. So what gifts do we need today? Well... Which gifts has the Holy Spirit distributed to you to grow the church? I'm just going to look around this congregation. I don't have a list in my head. I'm just going to look around, and I'm just going to start saying spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit has given to this church the gift of mowing the lawn. Why don't they mention it here to the church in Corinth? They didn't have lawns or lawn mowers. So they didn't need that spiritual gift at that time. But the Holy Spirit has given it here to this church, to these people, to work together to grow more believers. The spiritual gift of hospitality. The spiritual gift of making cookies. The spiritual gift of administration. The spiritual gift of teaching those little ones. The spiritual gift of generosity. The spiritual gift of making lots of money and giving it to the church. The spiritual gift of patience. The spiritual gift of kindness. The spiritual gift of love and leadership. Of, of making food for families who just had a newborn so that they're just overwhelmed with food. And it's so amazing that we don't have to worry about that. Incredible. The Holy Spirit has given those gifts to all of you to use as a group to make a car, right? When, when we use them all together as a church, as a unit, we carry together the work that God has called us to do, the Spirit wants us to do, which is to go out into the world with Jesus and grow more believers. Those are the three spiritual truths. 
So how do those spiritual truths help us to make sure that our hearts are in the right place when it comes to the privilege of the Spirit in our lives? I think it all has to do with the individual, right? The, the kid who's privileged and thinks that it's their right that everything be handed to them, that's not good. But to the person who recognizes what they are receiving, this special favor that they don't deserve, well, then that privilege is a good thing. So what about the privilege of the Spirit? By learning these truths, how can any of us do anything but be completely humble before God and others? I don't deserve the spiritual gift of faith. And yet the Holy Spirit, by His grace, has worked a miracle in me that I believe in my Lord and Savior, that I believe that Jesus is resurrected. That is a miracle of the Holy Spirit. And so there is no way that I could ever think that I earned or deserved any of it, or that I'm better than anyone else who may walk into the doors of this church or walk into my life outside of this church. No, the spiritual gift, the privilege of the Spirit keeps me humble, and it also makes me thankful. Man, the Holy Spirit has given you the gift of faith. He has given you spiritual gifts and talents that he has specifically given to you for the good and the growing of more believers. Can I just give you guys a to-do? Just try it. Every morning this week, okay? It's only seven, six days. I'll let you come back on Sunday. Every morning for six days, just say a quick prayer of thanks to God for the Holy Spirit in your life, for the faith that he has given you and the spiritual gifts that he's given you to grow more believers. Just try it. Because how can you not be thankful to God for the faith that he's given to you? And here's the third thing. By understanding these truths, faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit. God distributes gifts to everyone, and the gifts are given for growing more believers. Like, let's go, let, aren't you like motivated to go and use the gifts that the Spirit has given you? Like, go and do stuff for Jesus? Like, aren't you just like on fire? Aren't you just Holy Spirit fired up? <laughs> so this past week, I was doing Bible study with one of the dads from Holy Word Christian Academy, and we were talking about baptism. And he said, hmm, I don't know, that seems off to me, like Jesus is the way to heaven. The Holy Spirit's the only one who can create faith. How can I, as a father, bring my child to faith, Am I, I feel like I'm doing that. Like, I'm bringing my child to faith, and it, it's not me, I'm a sinner, like, only the Holy Spirit can create faith. And I'm like, yeah, that is exactly right. But isn't it amazing what the Holy Spirit did on Pentecost? That day, as the believers were in the room, and what happened? Tongues of fire came down. Do you know why the Holy Spirit did that? It's incredible. In the Old Testament, when a king or a priest or a prophet was going to be commissioned for work, we're designating you for this job, they anointed them with oil. The Holy Spirit, this isn't the first time the Holy Spirit in visible form anointed someone. Can you think of another time that the Holy Spirit came down and landed or anointed someone? Jesus at his baptism. And what was he commissioning Jesus to do there? To go and be the savior. That was the beginning of his ministry. And Jesus went as prophet, priest, and king to save us from our sins by his death and resurrection. And now here at Pentecost, who is the Holy Spirit anointing? The church. Not like this physical church, the group of believers. And he is commissioning them he is setting them aside for a specific purpose. And what is that specific purpose? To go out into the world and bring people to Jesus. Yes, it is true. You are a sinner. You cannot create faith. Only the Holy Spirit can create faith. He doesn't need your help. And then in his grace, he chose to need your help. And he said, here... Believer, I'm going to give you spiritual gifts, and I'm going to give you this thing that is called baptism. 
that you bring a person to baptism and you are bringing them to Jesus. Here, believer, I'm going to give you spiritual gifts and the word of God that you can go out into the world and bring Jesus to people. Isn't that an incredible privilege that you, as a congregation, as a church, with the spiritual gifts that God has given to you, are a link in the chain for a person's salvation by the grace of God. Don't worry, the Holy Spirit's got you. You're, you can't mess it up. <laughs> He's just giving you gifts to let you be along for the ride. And so Lucy, my daughter, was brought to Jesus today, and the Holy Spirit created faith and gave her forgiveness through the waters of baptism. You played a role in that with the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given to you. Thank you. On Friday, how many kids did we have up here? 18? Singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. And they all said, what did you learn about Jesus? And th these were the answers. I know that Jesus took away all my sins. Four or five-year-olds saying this. I know that Jesus loves me. I know that mommy's in heaven. I know that I have nothing to be afraid of because Jesus is with me. God has given to this church specific gifts of the Spirit and the faith in you so that you could go and grow more believers. Whether you're an early childhood director, a teacher, or somebody who helped weed the garden. You played your part. Thank you. I, I, what, a year and a half ago, there was a man who, who came wandering around and somehow ended up at this church because he thought the front lawn looked nice. His wife had recently passed away. He had no one else around. They had moved four months earlier, and then she got sick and died. He was lonely. He was sad. And he came to this church, and he came inside, and people were nice to him. And the coffee was really good. And the donuts, he enjoyed the donuts. And so he came back and he appreciated the word of God that was preached to him. And, and he came to Bible study and he became a member of this church. Why? Because you use the spiritual gifts that God has given to you and work them with the faith that God has given to you to grow more believers. So, Holy Word, on this Pentecost, I'm asking you to be humble with the privilege of the Holy Spirit, of the faith that he has given to you. I'm asking you to be thankful, thankful to God for his grace and mercy in your life and for the privilege to get to work for him and to grow his church. And then I'm asking you, Holy Word, to keep it up. Man, this is fun. Stay on fire with the Holy Spirit to use, this, use the gifts that God has given to you to grow more believers for Jesus. Amen.